So first off, welcome everybody. So tonight's presentation is by uh, Danielle Austin on the beauty of black and white. You know, black and white photography creates a timeless quality to image. It creates a choice if it can dramatically transform your image, but it can also help improve an image as it focuses more on the elements like tonality, contrast, texture, shape, form, and the quality of light. It is suitable for almost any type of genre, like landscape, portrait, architecture, still life, and street photography. Uh, Danielle will discuss the principles of black and white photography and why converting your images can be beneficial. She'll then demonstrate how to convert images using some of the most accessible post-processing software programs available. So without any further ado, Danielle Austin. Hi guys, thank you very much for having me join you tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, especially from New Jersey. <laughs> um, so mostly tonight, I'm just going to really talk about black and white. I'm not going to really get into, because I, I realize the timing is a little limited, so I'm not really going to get into really kind of showing any demonstration. Um, but I will talk to you guys at the end about if you might be interested in doing a, um, I've offered this to other clubs after my presentation and schedule it in the future, about if you're interested in learning, um, doing a two-hour little workshop online with Zoom, learning how to process in Lightroom or in Photoshop for those who might be interested in doing so. And I can talk more about that at the end. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about how I process though at the very end as well. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me so you guys know where I'm coming from with my background. So I've been in photography about 30 years and but probably professionally a little over 20 years at this point. So, but I started in my, like in the late eighties, but after college, I actually studied fine arts. I became a graphic designer. You will see a lot of design elements in my work. I'm always looking for design. Um, after a number of years being a graphic designer, I went back to school and became a photojournalist and studied journalism. I had always loved documentary photography. Worked for newspapers for a number of years, and but during my private personal time, I always liked being out in nature and kind of find out that was my happy place. And so I kind of walked away from that journalism career and then focused primarily on my fine art work. And it's predominantly nature. I really don't photograph people anymore. Um, I do love still a good environmental portrait if the opportunity comes, but specifically I stick with nature. But I do like most photographers, we love photographing pretty much anything that comes that kind of comes across us. You know, whether I love things that are abandoned, I love finding just wonderful details, pretty much anything that grabs my attention. I just love making images. Black and white. So for me, black and white, and just one thing briefly about my fine art career as well is I've been doing, I've uh, been an artist in residence for a number of years at national parks. If you're not sure what an artist in residence is, it's an opportunity for artists in any genre, in any experience, not just professionals, to be invited to a, um, some, a lot of them are national parks, but there are other places as well, and to work. They usually provide you housing. That's pretty much where that gets covered. And you spend anywhere between two weeks to four weeks and just focus on your work. So I've been an artist in residence. I've been invited there by the, national, uh, the Everglades National Park. I've been to Acadia National Park twice. Rocky Mountain National Park, Smoky Mountains National Park, and last year I was at Shenandoah National Park. So they've had a major impact on my work. Uh, my work gets a really good chance to have projects evolve and to explore new things. Uh, every time I now go to other national parks, I kind of treat them the same way. I treat it the same work ethic and just kind of get that time to create and so forth. So gives you a little bit of background of me. So for black and white, of course, since I've been in photography for over 30 years, it's been, I started in black and white. It's really how I learned photography. So I go from the days of film and shooting black and white. It was the easiest and the most affordable way to, uh, to shoot because guess what? You could do it in your bathroom. Uh, as long as you had in a larger, as long as you had a place, a dark space to work. I saw this picture of the tub online and I immediately downloaded it because it looked exactly the way my setup was back in the 90s. So I had everything set up, except for it was reversed. The faucet was on the other side. But, you know, as long as you had a dark space, you could you could basically roll up your film. You could, you know, process your film and develop your images right in the comforts of your own home. So it was quite a nice way to work. And that's how I always been. So now we get to do it digitally. 
but the beauty of the kind of the history of black and white, well, it's, that's how film started. I mean, it's everything kind of started from the back of the 1800s when photography came about. And this is everybody worked with, especially in that time, glass, then into film. And, but of course, even when in, 30, in the 1930s, when we got color, it never stopped. Black and white never went, never left. Most of our favorite photographers were always black and white photographers. Um, I actually just finished watching, um, I was on a, on a Zoom presentation right before this meeting uh, with um, the Soho photo, if maybe you guys know of it in Soho, of course, New York. It uh, was Harvey Stein. So he's been a photographer for 50 years. Uh, Coney Island is kind of his background, uh, or like sort of his backyard, you might say. He's done a number of photo books and he predominantly does most of his work in black and white. He still shoots film. So bless his heart and still loves working in that field. So um, if anyone's interested in seeing his presentation, um, I believe it will be up on the website tomorrow, sometime tomorrow on at that Soho photo. And you're welcome to watch and listen to him talk. But apparently he still does, he's still teaching and gives workshops. So if you're into street photography, definitely one worth watching for sure. But so black and white, you know, was again, um, it just has a timeless effect. It's just beautiful. I love black and white. I do a lot of the work I'm doing right now is actually, I still shoot everything, a lot of things in black and white, but I have a certain project of abstracts that I'm working in right now, pure color. But it just, sometimes it's the project that leads me in the direction of which way I'm going to go. Um, but, you know, a lot of people still love that true ethnic of just what black and white is. Ansel Adams. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely of the old school. I, you know, these were the, the photographers I absolutely loved looking at um, were those of the earlier part of the 20th century. Ansel Adams to me was just always a genius when it came to working in black and white and how he processed his images was absolutely breathtaking and really just bringing them to life. And I've just always been a big fan of his work. As I think a lot of people are. Um, Henry Ricardo Brisson, you know, that kind of that one, that wait moment, you know, setting up a scene and then waiting for something to come into the scene. And just again, that master of street photography in black and white, one of his more famous images. Edward Weston, you know, you'll see my version is behind me and you'll see it in the presentation as well, but he was so much about just form and shape and texture, just absolutely beautiful work that he created. Um, I mean, who can make a pepper look like that? So absolutely beautiful work. Uh, Richard Avedon, an amazing, amazing portrait photographer. I never remember the, um, the, uh, the artist here on the left, uh, but that is the model Twiggy on the right. The beautiful images. Of course, those, these you might definitely recognize. Margaret Bourke White was actually one of the reasons I got into journalism in the first place. You know, she's probably considered the first female journalist and I absolutely was just breath, just captivated by her style and her work. She also had the first cover of Life magazine. Um, this image speaks in so many ways and so many vol in so, such volume. Sebastian Salgado, he's actually still alive, though he's definitely up there in the years, but absolutely beautiful work that he does and still predominantly shoots in black and white. You know, just great, did a whole series on oil miners down in Brazil. I think it was Brazil or was it Chile? I'm not quite sure. Mary Ellen Mark unfortunately has passed away. Um, brilliant photographer as well. Always did very more human interest stories and really just about everyday people. Absolutely beautiful work too. Breathtaking. Always usually worked in black and white. I always highly recommend looking up these, these photographers if you haven't seen their work. Uh, Fan Ho, an amazing Chinese photographer absolutely beautiful black and whites in his images as well. He passed away a few years ago too. And just absolutely stunning image. And then Vivia Mayer. And then she just came into our world literally only a handful of years ago when somebody eventually discovered all her images that had never been published. No one ever even knew who she was. Just a woman photographer who just did it on her own personal time. And just, you know, this one guy who discovered a hundred thousands of images of hers just amazing breathtaking images that she did always these great little moments on the streets again black and white always the way to world so why choose black and white i honestly and wholeheartedly believe i think it helps us teach us how to see 
and to make us better as photographers, as we're not focusing so much on the color, but everything else, the contrast, the texture, the shape, the form, and the quality of the light. Because color can be so powerful that this gets us really to focus on everything else. And, you know, because color really does depict our reality. Black and white is a true interpretation of reality. As I might transfer an image into black and white one way, you might do it completely different. And that's the beauty of it as it's an interpretation. So why? Because it can create such a beautiful emotion. Because again, we're not focused on the color. We have to really look at the image and everything about the image. And we can put our own emotion into that image. Color distractions. So it's, again, sometimes color can be so distracting that we're not focusing where we need to in the image. So it's also a great opportunity if there is bad color, whether it's bad lighting, bad distracting elements in the background, it really can get us to focus just on the, on the tones and everything since now we're looking at it in black and white. So contrast. You know, that's one of the most great things about black and white is that beautiful high contrast. I'm, you know, I'm definitely a photographer of the Ansel Adams genre in that sense. I love lots of very variety of tones in my images, but sometimes those really, really high contrast, very black and white can just be beautiful, but it allows us really to see some amazing details in there, but it really just sometimes just brings an image basically to life. Um, and it works great. I, you know, for me immediately, when I see a sunny day, I'm like, okay, there's a good chance this image is going to be black and white immediately, just because I see that contrast going on. So this is De um, Death Valley. Again, bright sunny days. And that's usually what you're going to get most time in Death Valley. <laughs> and you might get some clouds, but just there's so much great texture in the mountains there, but on high, just makes really beautiful images in the high contrast areas. Even this is now in Cades Cove out in the Smoky Mountains. Beautiful sunny day, but with that, you know, that great sun, it really gave some contrast to break apart the green of the tree and the green of the grass. So it gave us that great, that kind of that nice separation I was looking for. Simple thing is just is trees. I love photographing trees. And when there's a lot of texture on a tree, like a good sycamore tree, there's all these very light colors and dark colors. Add a little bit of snow in there and some gray clouds, kind of create something kind of interesting. And of course, Death Valley, the sand dunes, you know, that early morning when that bright sky comes up and lights up everything really creates something very high contrast. Or something as simple as, sadly, this is the pathway of a horseshoe crab. Um, it never, it, you can see the, there's the shell little bits of here and there, different ones, but the, there's the trail. I think it was trying to find its way back out and just never made it back out to the, to the ocean. So interesting things we find in nature. Danielle, is that on sand? That is sand. And that's, again, the beauty of, you know, playing with it is it was a very bright, sunny day. And I was able to just really tone down the sand, just took that color down, really just made it dark. So just so I could get that trail to really pop out and the beauty, and that's kind of how I, that was my interpretation of it. Something as simple. I, you know, one of my other favorite topics I love talking about is long exposures in nature. And, you know, so this is the, the waves crashing over rocks on a sunny day using a high, a, a neutral density filter. And it just gives that wonderful misty kind of feeling floating through the rocks. So the right light, the wonderful, beautiful thing about black and white photography, in my opinion, there is no bad light. <laughs> Everything is right light. So, um, you know, using the light, though, is how you can really bring that image to life as well. But it kind of, you know, just choosing what you want to use. But boy, you know, when you've got bad lighting, black and white could save the day. That is for sure. But in most occasions, 
we're looking for either side lighting or back lighting. You know, the direct lighting is going to give you that contrast. So on a bright, sunny day in the middle of the day, you'll get that great kind of contrast. But side lighting is going to bring you that beautiful texture. Um, it can do some beautiful things on human faces as well. And then back lighting gives you that shape and form, which is really very cool. So this is Duke Farms. If uh, you've ever been to New Jersey or if you know anything about Doris Duke, she was at one point the richest woman in the world. Uh, she passed away in the 90s. She happens to be my neighbor, um, literally one mile as a fly crow, as a fly, as a crow flies. <laughs> a beautiful estate here. Uh, it's about 800, it's about 3,000 acres they own, but about 800 of it is a park. Her dad was, of course, James B. Duke. He was the American tobacco king. But this is actually where the orchid range was, or is actually. Um, the building's been around for 100 years, but on a bright sunny day, that great high contrast, the middle of the day, again, gives you that kind of nice contrast of lighting. I love on bright blue sunny day days is making the skies very dark. I love that effect. Very Ansel Adams as well. Just one way of interpretation. Same Spanish moss down in South Carolina. Bright sunny day, but there you go. You can really make some interesting, brings out a lot of interesting things out of it, that kind of contrast. Texture. That side lighting. This is in Acadia National Park where the waves are crashing along the rocks, but that low light, that side lighting is coming through, really can pull out all that really cool texture. Niagara Falls, same idea. It was um, in the morning and the light just hit that one little bit of water going over the falls. This is on the Canadian side and the rest of it went into shadow and just good timing on my part. I was there actually in the winter time. And, but that one little bit of side lighting coming through and just hitting that one bit of road, one little bit of water. Shooting into this on that backlighting is very, it's a lot of fun to do. This is actually um, one of my local creeks that I love to go to. And this is in the winter time. What you're seeing, I'm shooting into the sun. So it kind of almost is a black and white. They might get a little bit of color, a little yellow, but this is the snow. This is the ice. And then that over here is the creek. A big wide creek brings out a lot of fun texture after one of our ice storms this actually was a storm in new york a number of years ago early morning being backlit really just illuminates everything really shows the form and the shape of the trees and the ice on it and of course a good old uh Palm, Royal Palm down in Florida, the, you know, just when it's being backlit, really can just bring all this amazing cool texture out in here. Are all of these images we're seeing converted from color or are you actually shooting in black and white? I shoot everything in color. I shoot Thank everything you. in color. Because I believe, because, you know, we think about every image has millions of colors and the idea that converts into millions of tones, gray tones for you. And though you can do, if you're shooting raw, you could shoot in black and white and then bring that image. Apparently you can do it, bring it in back into color. Um, I've never tried it, but I've been told you definitely can do that. But I like to bring every, I like to shoot the best color image I can and then convert and then create the tones I want. Because a lot of times I manipulate the colors because in my opinion, color is everything to a black and white photo. Everything. I will actually change the hue of a color to get the tone I want. I'll change the saturation of a color or the luminosity of a color to get that tone that I'm looking for. So yeah. But I think, you know, some people try to see it, they can envision it, but Here's the funny thing is too, there are times though, because I swear that this image is going to be great in black and white and like, no, that didn't work. So I'm glad I had it in color because there are a few times I think it's definitely going to go that way and it just doesn't. So um, another great time to photograph, one of my favorite times to photograph uh, or actually process images into black and white are on the rainy, foggy, snowy days when a lot of times, a lot of people don't like going out, but those are great times to be out photographing. They make beautiful black and whites, you know, um, you know, we had great fog this morning. Unfortunately, I had appointments, so I couldn't get out there. And I'm like, oh, you know, when you get those nice days, you just want to get out and go shooting somewhere. Um, if you get snow, yippee, it's always a great time to be out there too. Um, Cause it's all about the mood. Uh, this actually is one of our reservoirs in New Jersey. This is actually, I'm actually photographing from a kayak. So, cause I do, um, I like to get on the water with my camera. It's a great way to photograph sometimes, get different perspective. 
Uh, this place is known for its dead trees. And when we get those good foggy days, you're out there before the sun comes up. Acadia National Park, this is Bubble Pond. There's supposed to be Bubble Mountain in the background, but good fog, but the Maine is known for its fog as well. So why not embrace it when you can? Always, a, no matter, I'm a big, I am a true believer that you can photograph any time of day, all day, and you will find something to create and maybe make a great black and white. That is for sure. Maine as well, very typical Maine, lobster boat in the fog. This was uh, my actually my very first night in Shenandoah National Park for my artist residency last summer. This amazing storm came right through the valley. Uh, had never seen anything quite like it before, but it was a nice show and I was thrilled to be there and good weather, good black and white. We had a lot of good storms in Shenandoah. That's a nice thing. I was there actually for the month of July and a lot of good, a lot of haze. A lot of smoke coming from the California forest fires last year, but good storms that came through as well. But I love, you know, the Blue Mountains, you know, just absolutely fantastic just for layers and make great black and whites as well. I hit, um, I was actually down in Maryland on a family vacation and Assateague was an hour south. So I went down there for a few hours. Great stormy skies. <laughs> you know, it's like, yippee. Um, and did a nice long exposure right there. This is on the Bay side. I was on the Maryland side. There's also the Virginia side, but I'm a huge fan of trees, especially dead trees. I'm not sure why, just always love, I'm always kind of drawn to them. And of course, when it snows, so I always like, you know, our snow, unfortunately in New Jersey, it's either, it, we usually get the one day of snow and then the next day is bright blue skies. So if you can get out there while it's snowing, I try to do that if I can without killing myself, of course. And then of course, if you go to Alaska, you get great mountains with snow everywhere anyways, which is always nice too. And this actually was from a great place. Um, it was this abandoned, well, this old kind of relic uh, school, high school out in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. It's an old mining town. And um, they occasionally get allow photo groups to come in and photograph it. They've got new ownership. I guess they're trying to actually bring it back but it was a great place to go around and photograph. A little cold on a winter day though. So another reason, texture. If you have images that have just amazing texture, black and whites really will just emphasize it and pull out all that amazing detail, more so than you'll ever see in color. And it's just absolutely wonderful to work with if that's what your image is really about including the one behind me. So this is um, the Mesquite Flat, you know, the Mesquite Flat sand dunes out in Death Valley. Great time, early morning or late in the afternoon. Great, just when the sun comes up, just pulls all that great texture out. It's like a kid in a candy store photographing there. Early morning on a beach. This one was actually in Alaska. Again, that low light just brings all that great texture in the sand. This is actually in, in Everglades. If you're there, I usually, when I used to go, I spent a lot of time in the Everglades. Um, haven't been there in a while, but in there, in the wintertime, it's definitely, it's the dry season and it's kind of like cracked earth. It's kind of interesting to see it. Cool place to go visit. And water. Again, water is one of my favorite subjects. Trees being my second favorite. Always looking for the great texture of water. Or ice. So... One way or the other can bring it some beautiful texture. And wildlife, you know, um, I look for all kinds of things. And I see, like, I've been, like I said, this down in the Everglades, bird life is really rampant down there, which is great. I'm not a big wildlife photographer, but boy, when it comes across, I get something close, I'm excited. And there's that abandoned school again. Great walls, great texture, just a wonderful place to photograph. I love abandoned things. I think most of us do. Anything with brick walls is great with, I think, in black and white, in my opinion. This is the same school. I was walking around one of the old bathrooms and I saw this glass and I was trying to decide whether it looked like a cat, a bird, or like a Batman. I haven't quite figured out which one yet, but, and then I just kind of sat there and I love the texture of the glass. And then I just waited for the clouds to kind of come through and just wait till like, I got a cloud right where I wanted it. 
patterns. So the same idea with texture is in many ways, we don't always necessarily see the patterns when we have something in color where it really will come so much more apparent in a black and white image. And again, that design aspect of me, that kind of that graphic designer of me always is looking for texture and patterns. I look for patterns everywhere. So this is actually one of the days I was out kayaking as well. Uh, those lily pads, if you guys can see me on the video, those lily pads were only about this big. They were quite tiny, but it's then it's always the perspective. I actually put the camera right on the surface of the water. And again, shooting into the light, so it's being backlit. There wasn't much color. There was a little bit of hints of green, but it, so it automatically makes a very cool black and white. But just that repetition of the droplets on the pattern on the on the lily pads. <laughs> Spider webs, big fan of them as long as the spiders are not there. Love always seeing them. But again, backlit, so you can see everything just being illuminated like that. Love just in, this is in the Everglades. In the morning, yeah, I got to be really careful of when you go out into the, if you decide to go actually out into the glades, um, it's literally just filled with spider webs everywhere in the morning. It's pretty wild and it's kind of freaky at the same time. Of course, the salt flats out in Death Valley, they make awesome patterns. And it's pretty much white. So good way to go black and white. I have no idea what this is, but on one of my hikes, I came across this. And I thought it was just absolutely really very cool. So again, that repetition of pattern. And on a flight, this is actually uh, leaving Denver, heading home when I was visiting a friend, coming back during winter, had snowed. This is actually the high plains. Um, boy, what a great view. I mean, it looks like a marble or checkerboard or something, but I thought it was just quite fascinating. And it's very rare because most times I never get a, uh, window seat. I always usually get an aisle seat. So good day for me. <laughs> and of course, this fun, cool things I come across. This was at a junkyard. Love just metals. Beautiful. In my opinion, black and white. I love metal and black and white. Very, very cool. Landscape. So we're going to talk a little bit about genres. And again, you know, I'm predominantly a nature photographer. I really don't do a lot of grand landscapes, but if I come across them, of course, I'm going to make the image when I see them. I'm more about the intimate scenes. I really do love. Um, I'm a true lover of abstract in nature, but, you know, um, I've since I've had, you know, over 20 some years, I've photographed many different things. I still enjoy photographing many things. And many of you guys have definitely, everybody has a different interest, but the beauty of black and white is it looks good in anything. It really, really does. So what the beautiful thing about landscapes, I think, I think for most is having good skies, you know, really active skies, good clouds. I mean, that's what really sometimes brings a beautiful black and white to life in a landscape. So this was um, out in the Rocky Mountains. My first time, my first time out there was actually on Thanksgiving weekend. It just snowed, and then the next morning the sun was just coming out. Get great clouds as well. You can see this is the pathway everybody was tracking in um, up to Dream Lake. I totally was not up for it. They're talking when you're not when you're used to being at elevation zero, and then you're suddenly at eighty five hundred feet. <laughs> your body is not quite used to that but what a beautiful area. Yellowstone, you know, great. We know even in, I was there in May, still a lot of snow on the mountains in the backdrop, but just a great place to explore and great skies. This is Shenandoah after actually one of the storms and this beautiful thing about uh, the mountains down there, they really do smoke afterwards. You know, the Smoky Mountains do it, but this is a, an extension of it. This is the Blue Ridge Mountains, but it really does in the summertime that all that smoke just comes off the mountains after storms passing. The Everglades on a beautiful sunny day, but boy, great clouds came through. And Acadia, you know, always love, I always like, I'm a big fan of big stormy days. I just a big, I always, that kind of weather just excites me. That's a lot of drama. And of course, Death Valley. Um, if you've ever been to Beth Valley, it only rains normally about two inches a year. Uh, we got one of the days, the last day I was there was one of the days it rained about a half an inch. It really did pour, but boy, some great skies, some really very, very cool skies. Structures. 
So if you happen to like, I mean, I love abandoned places. So I photograph a lot of abandoned sites if when I ever get the opportunity to, but if you're into like architectural photography or just, you know, structures of any kind, it could be sculptures and just name it. You can find something that has a lot of structure to it are beautiful in black and white as well. So whenever you're traveling, always think about black and white. This is from the High Line in New York City. Again, I'm looking for abstracts. So whatever this, I forget, don't know what building this was, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Love the design, see the patterns. Always looking for that as well. This is Bethlehem Steel Stacks, uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour from me. Great place. If you're ever down in the area, they basically turned it into a tourist site. So it's got a visitor center now. There's a huge Christmas market in the parking lot. In the summertime, there's concerts across the street is the Art Quest's building. And there's a theater inside, a movie theater. They've got concerts inside as well. They have weddings there. There's a bar there. There's a restaurant there. And then Bethlehem is right across the downtown, is across the river. Great town as well. Great restaurants. But a very cool place to come visit. Um, you can't have access on the inside. It's just the exterior, mostly on one side. But boy, for a photographer, if anybody, if you like lots of texture and you like lots of patterns and you like very cool rusty things, very cool place to come visit. Great church. I just was on my way driving through, you know, I do a lot of back roads in New Jersey because again, I try to avoid the highways. So I found this beautiful old church in Northern Jersey. Um, but again, the skies just add to the feeling and the emotion to the place of that a feeling of abandonment. We have Sandy Hook Beach. Um, if you've been, ever, been there, it's a very cool. It's actually part of it is actually part of the National Park Service. It is a what they call the National Gateway, National Recreational Get, Gateway of I forget that whole name of it. Everybody refers to it as Sandy Hook. Um, it's the northernmost beach of New Jersey. So off season, it's free on season during the summertime, you do have to pay to get in, but what a great place. People love to fish here. There's great, it's great beaches. Um, it has an old historic um, naval base or actually from the civil war. So it's basically this old abandoned Fort Hancock. The coast guard is still active on the site, but it's just a very cool place to kind of walk around and explore but amazing texture on this thing. It's been standing around for 150 years, almost. Down, we have also New Jersey's got the beautiful Pine Barrens, also part of the National Park Service. So uh, it's a big area that's protected. This is actually Basto. It's kind of the, it's kind of one of those areas, kind of, again, a tourist site area to go to. But again, I'm a huge fan. You got a brick wall, looks awesome in black and white. This was the abandoned school. Again, great place. Just love all the great texture in there. A lot of cool mood, bright, sunny day. But then again, on an overcast day, this is a bridge. This is actually the town. Uh, this is on Hillsborough. Is, uh, my hometown is on the other side. I'm on the Raritan side, which is across the river. And just absolutely great bridge. Love structures in black and white. Um, I just recently went to an old pump house uh, that we one of the camera clubs got access to. Believe it, it's still active, but it's been around for about a hundred years and it seems like it's falling apart. So but a kind of an interesting place to explore. And then again, this was a this was actually a structure in Savannah, Georgia, right along the water. Beautiful, this kind of huge, massive boat structure, somebody a sculpture that somebody designed. And love the lines, all the design elements. So still lights. So pretty much everything that can fall in that category. I don't do, I don't make still lifes. I don't create still lifes. I like finding still lifes out and about during my travels. Um, but it's all about the subject and the form. And again, it looks great in black and white. You know, simple things as pillars. You know, the light was just hitting it right, made a beautiful gradation of gray tones. Believe it or not, people, guys, I know a lot of people who love photographing flowers and anything like that. I love that stuff in black and white. Then I found this little critter in here as well. That just kind of, long as he stayed there, I was good. But look at that wonderful, it's kind of being backlit. It's the back of the leaf, all that great texture and design. Something simple as a uh, milkweed being backlit. 
old rusty cars. <laughs> you know, um, we have a place down in the Pine Barrens. Uh, one of our one of a uh, photographer I know, Rich, um, another speaker. If you guys ever want to learn something about the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, um, Richard Lewis. He does a lot of tour. He does a lot of um, workshops down in the South Jersey in the Pine Barrens, but he also gets access to this amazing, um, basically graveyard of old cars and airplanes and wonderful place to explore. And that was there as well. Again, I love things like, again, anything that creates patterns, lots of texture, great detail shots. Down in Georgia. Savannah, one of the uh, cemetery, famous cemetery down there. And loving this was down at this over at Sandy Hook, on one of the old gates on the uh, abandoned fort. And this actually, unfortunately, this place does not exist. Uh, this was the old um, lace factory in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's one of these locations that literally one day everybody was told to go home and the place shut down and literally just in one day and everything was just kind of left there. And so it became sort of a, a great place for people who could get access to it, um, had workshops there and it's just a wonderful place to explore. But sadly, they eventually did tear it down. And wildlife, as I mentioned before, I am not a wildlife photographer. Um, if the opportunity presents itself in front of me, oh my gosh, yes, I will definitely photograph it, whatever it is, but I don't go out and seek it. I don't have the patience. A wildlife photographer has to have the utmost unbelievable patience and I don't. <laughs> I can stand like an hour or two hours in one place in a creek photographing my water abstracts, but for wildlife, no, I just don't have that kind of patience. So, but I spent a lot of time in the Everglades and the wonderful thing about the Everglades, especially in the winter time is the wildlife kind of comes to you and especially the birds because they're looking for water and the water is closer to where the people are, the roads and things like that, which is awesome. Summertime, forget about it. It's very rare. You're going to see anything, but the wintertime they're there and it's awesome. So if I see something, I'll see it, but pretty much anything that's pretty monochromatic makes a great black and white. So if you've been on a safari, elephants or tiger, you know, bears, and I mean, not bears, but you know, lions or anything, they look great in black and white. They really, really do. So, but most of mine are birds. This lovely guy actually flew almost right to me. I had my 70 to eight, my 70 to 200 millimeter lens. That's all I had with me at the time. And he just flew right to me and landed on the boardwalk next to me. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Never is going to happen again, but it was a nice moment. Um, I love these guys. You know, this is a um, wood stork. I, I always call it the face only a mother would love, um, but I find them absolutely beautiful and great texture. Look at all that great texture in their face. This is a juvenile. I don't think he knew that he, I mean, I shot this with a 400 millimeter, but I don't think he knew he was supposed to be this close to me. This is a snowy egret. They dance on the water. They have yellow legs and they dance on the water to get the fish to come up to the surface. This poor little heron, I don't know. He got his wings kind of stuck in all the mangroves and everything. But again, he's pretty much bluish gray. Kind of fun. It's really amazing all this great texture around him. Cormorants, got them everywhere, even in New Jersey. But this one was, death, death, uh, was down in the Everglades as well. Call it the call of the wild. And of course, gators, great subjects to photograph. Again, they have really some cool color in them. It's mostly browns and everything. And they're really quite beautiful. Uh, that great texture and the great skin, but love them in black and white. Especially this guy. And if you can see right here, there's like a mosquito, right? Reflecting. You can't quite see it on his eye over here, but you can see it in reflecting in the shadow. Or something like a koi pond. Uh, recently, I was at a gardens and they had these massive koi just in this pond. Like they were well over like a foot long, huge things. I'm not used to seeing such big ones, but there's this one lonely little white guy just kind of swimming around. So people. So the last kind of genre I love to talk about, and again, I haven't been photographing people in many years. So some of, most of these images are definitely older. And when you work in newspapers, as I did, most of the stuff we pr produced was in color, but there were always certain images that I just felt I liked them better in black and white. So I always try to transfer, um, but it can be very, you know, black and white's very flattering on people, um, especially on Caucasian skin, as you know, our skin really 
absorbs, you know, all the light. So white skin, is, unfortunately, gets very pink, can get very magenta, it can get very green. Yeah, depending on the lighting and a very yellow. So it's just, you know, I hate to say Caucasian skin can be it's just what's going to absorb what's ever around us. So um, it's kind of what it is, you know, but that's why I think I, you know, I personally think I look better in black and white, <laughs> but um, you know, especially when shooting outdoors or shooting, photographing people, if you can get them in the shade, it's much more flattering. It definitely, it's just, you know, no harsh shadows on the skin. And if you can get them underneath a tree or in the building, it's great. The light is so much softer. Window light is gorgeous on skin, um, but direct lighting, I'll show you one example of a direct lighting that actually worked, but in most cases, I would say it doesn't work. Um, but so we're always kind of looking for those kind of angles, you know, that were that kind of light that works best on our skin. So this was uh, one of the job, one of the assignments I was doing. This was a World War II vet. Sadly, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he was going to be honored at an event, a Memorial Day event that they were having. And they wanted he was hope he wanted to get back in his uniform to see and it actually fit. So we're at his home beautiful window light, putting on the uniform. I think he just kind of got lost in the moment, which was really wonderful for me, but just beautiful on his face. Great light on his face, brought all that beautiful detail in his face as well. So this is an example, of really harsh, harsh light. Um, we're doing a story on homeless teenagers or simply teenagers who were in the foster care system. And, but at 18, they age out and what happens to them now they no longer have support. So many of them become homeless. And so we were trying to tell the story of that. And so the day I was scheduled to photograph this gentleman, he's 19 at this point, um, was a bright, sunny day, but there was an abandoned building nearby. And I said, hey, do you mind going? It kind of add to the story. And it was great because when he got on the wall, the light was just, he just kind of, I had him just turn his head just a little bit. And so the light came down and beautifully lit his face. He has beautiful skin absolutely gorgeous. So, but what I loved about this is it put out all the wrinkles in his shirt. And I think that helped to also tell the story because of course, you know, this is a kid that, you know, in most cases, he's probably hand washing his clothes or maybe air drying, or he's not going to have an iron, you know? So having that kind of crumpled up shirt is just tells more part about his story. So in that situation, I think it worked out really, really well. So this is a little story um, I actually did. This is my mom, actually. And you can see she's a bilateral amputee. And when I would come to visit, uh, a lot of times my mom would be watching in one room. My dad would be in the other room in his man cave. And they're watching their own shows. But her legs, her prosthetics would get to bother her at nighttime. So she would take them off. And he would come out, though, in the evening and just say, hey, do you need anything, some tea or dessert or something? So they would do this little routine on certain nights where he would come out and he just always reach out just to have that little bit of a connection. So I knew I wanted to have that Henry Carter Brisson moment where I had the setting. I knew what was going to happen. I anticipated it and then photographed it. But it was a lot of color in this room. There's a lot of color in the, in the you know, the, um, the curtains, the shade. So I knew I wanted to go black and white because I liked the way the light just kind of came in and just lit up this basically her limbs. And that was kind of the idea. Something backlighting people, you don't necessarily always have to see people's faces um, if you can still tell the story. And something like this, I'm at a friend's wedding and I'm just taking photos as just as a gift. And not, I, was not the, I was not the main photographer by any means. I was there as a guest, but I always bring my camera anyways. And the girls came out and they're enjoying before really everybody's coming into the room. And you can see clearly what's happening. You know, the flower girls, they've got the flowers, they're dancing, they're enjoying. You can see the cake in the background. So there you go, especially with something backlit. So I photographed surfing for the first time this summer. Believe it or not, I had never photographed surfing. We had um, Belmar down here on one of the shore towns has an annual surfing competition in September. And uh, one of the hurricanes was passing by out in the far ocean, but boy, gave us some good waves. We don't usually get good waves out here. Our waves are kind of a joke, actually. But good waves, the surfers were enjoying it. But I was just in love with the texture of the water. And, you know, just, I thought it was kind of fun. Don't really need the color. It's kind of a bland blue sky. The water was not a pretty color at all either. It was kind of this a lot of mucky, murky kind of water. And even though I did a lot in color of these images I did, but I love this particular one because I just love the way the waves worked because of the way his surfboard made the waves work. 
And like, as I mentioned before, I think I look better in black and white. So I, anytime anybody takes a picture of me, I do my best to do it in black and white. So this was done years ago. I still love using it. So <laughs> I refuse to admit that I'm aging, but so I'm just going to show you guys some brief, some comparisons and why I did black and white. So some black and whites and colors. This was Sandy Hook. I happened to be there one day, high tide. It was noon, sunny skies, but clouds came up, which was awesome. And I saw this tree and I said, well, we're going to have to work with it. But I knew immediately I could go black and white. And you could just add so much drama with it when you go black and white. Out in Rocky Mountains, overcast day. I love a good lake. Give me again, a good piece of driftwood. Yippee. Works out well, but in color, nah, it just comes more to life. I think in a bit of a black and white can bring out a lot of great texture in black and white. Again, sunny, sunny days out in the Death Valley, but amazing color. And look at all those tones, absolutely fantastic tones. And you could just do really cool things with them when you transfer to black and white. Waterfalls, sometimes we happen to be there. It's a sunny day when you're there. Throw on a neutral density filter and I can get a nice long exposure, which is great, but it's still sunny. Eh, not always a great option. But in black and white, it can make it pretty cool and graphic. That's rocky, That's up in the Rocky Mountains as well. If you've ever been down in South Carolina, if you've been to Wormslough, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, believe it or not, a friend and I were driving by. We, our intention was not to go here, but we actually happened to be passing the area, and but it was closing. And so we asked them, do you mind if we just take some pictures of the tree line? We're not going to go all the way down, but we could just take some pictures of the tree line. They're like, yeah, sure, no problem. Loved it. The car lights, people coming out, um, added a nice kind of something a little different to it. But thrown in black and white, I think it could go either way. But again, when I see these, when I see this wonderful high contrast situations, blue skies, great tree. This is again, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the beach uh, down in South Carolina. It's where all the all the oaks are, and right along the tree. There's not many left because of all the storms that have been happening over the years, but it's a great place to get these wonderful trees along the coastline. Just again, all dead trees, nothing out there but nothing but blue skies. But it makes a great black and white, in my opinion. Really graphic, very contrasty. And simple things. I love the little details. Again, a little bit of the the palm. And a little bit of the, I forget what the stuff's called, but it makes a fun black and white. Flowers. I know people are like, how can you make a flower, beautiful color flower in black and white? You should try. You never know. <laughs> it's pretty. It's beautiful in color. I love it in color. I love photographing flowers. It's actually one of my guilty pleasures. I don't really do anything with them, but boy, I love photographing flowers. I love going to gardens and always creating images. They're just why not? They're beautiful. But I'm always love to see what they can be like in black and white as well. And it just changes the focus. It's a completely different image. It tells a different story. It's always worth trying. And something simple. You know, I decided you could go very dark with this or very light. Beautiful, the calmness of it. Just went very light with it. Again, my interpretation of it. On a great day on the beach and the end of the day, there's some good clouds out there. This is blue hour, right? As the sun's gone down, everything's at blue. Long exposure, all that mist coming through, all the waves crashing creates a great mist. But black and white can make it very cool as well. A lot of texture. Now, I always say sometimes there are things that are almost black and white. Go ahead and make them black and white. There might be times you'll definitely keep it in color because that just that little bit of color is what really brings that image to life. But there are definitely times just go ahead, make it black and white. Niagara Falls, one of the days we were there, really overcast day, was great. Uh, there's In the wintertime, there's only one area that you can get down low to the falls, and but it made it like very outer worldly. But in black and white, again, it just adds a little bit more dynamic to it. Very ethereal. And again, the Smoky Mountains, boy, when it gets, when, after the storms, again, it really, all that clouds and smoke and everything is just awesome. But that little bit of black, just taking it to that black and white, just pushing it over the edge, right to black and white, again, really pulls more of the texture out. 
for me, a lot of times what we have a lot in New Jersey is a lot of creeks. We have a lot of area, a lot of nature preserves around here. So there are a lot of creeks, a lot of brooks, fantastic in the wintertime because what's wonderful because there's small little bodies of water, you're going to have lots of ice on the edge and you'll still have the water flow in the middle. But again, you see, it's just a little bit of color in there. But why not make it a little black and white too? But it's awesome for wonderful thing with this time of year. And waterfalls, we have a lot of waterfalls. Um, I mean, anywhere you go, there are a lot of times there's not going to be any greenery around here. But if it's just the stone, there's a little bit of green on it. But I go for the graphic. I love the design. And really more the dynamic that you can get from it. This is actually uh, Yellowstone. Again, the sun was getting low. Love it in color, actually. But I always like to see what it might look like in black and white. And I like images sometimes when they work both ways. Something simple as a scale of, of a skull. It's actually a, a cow skull, I believe. And But you know, when I put it in black and white, boy, that texture really popped out even more so. so sometimes just take it over. And something as simple as like a you know, stadium seats, right? Or just actually in an auditorium. But the black and white really kind of pops out the patterns, and the light, which is really nice. And we talk about sometimes how bad lighting or bad color can make better black and whites. So, you know, if, when you come across those situations where, you're like, oh man, there's no good color or the lighting's not bad, take the photo anyways, always make the photo. You just never, never know what you might possibly get. So we have one of our, uh, just, just north of Atlantic City, we have this huge, huge uh, preserve uh, called Forsyth, uh, great for burgers. And, but it's just a really cool place. They had, this is the bay side, or sort of the bay side of it. And because it's right along the ocean, beautiful sunny day, brutally windy. But again, it was early spring, not good color at all. But you could do a lot more in black and white. You could bring out a lot of really great texture out in black and white. Same thing when I was down in South Carolina, it was really hazy out. Um, but I, I love the way the light was coming across the water here. And it's like, okay, not a great picture in color at all, but I bet you I can play with it in black and white. I think it did okay. Same thing up in the Rocky Mountain. By the time I got up to the very top, there's this one trail called the Fall River Trail. It's one way, it's like nine miles or something to get almost to the top part of the park. And But it was flat, not much light up there. But I love the texture, what I was seeing. Again, you never know. So it's always worth making the image just to see what you can create with it. And the same thing, this is in Yellowstone. Driving, we're in the uh, northern part of the park, driving, saw this cool pathway. And I'm like, oh, I love this. And it kind of leads up right into the mountain, but it's completely backlit, horrible lighting. But you can do something in black and white, which is kind of cool. Or in really, you know, simple things like a structure as well. This was a very overcast day out in Death Valley, um, just at the end of the day, a lot of clouds rolled in and everything. This is actually a ghost town just outside of Death Valley, actually. And, but I love the texture of the building, you know? So in black and white, you can really pull that out. And people. So an example, so this is my one of my stepsisters and that's her actually, this was uh, her husband now. And she was a bridesmaid at a wedding. Somebody took a picture on their phone. This was a several years ago. And she sends this to me and goes, help. And it's like, yikes, there's not much I could do with it other than, well, go black and white. It's the only thing you can sometimes do. Now that I have uh, Topaz's A1 Denoise, I would probably then take it through Denoise to get rid of all that noise as well. But sometimes, like I said, black and white can really help save the day. So how do we see in black and white? So this is what I love to talk about just a little bit is us thinking about how important color really is in a black and white image and understanding how those colors can transfer into beautiful tones of grays. And we normally think of light colors as becoming highlights and whites and the darker colors becoming the shadows and really the blacks. But the reality is now with post-processing, digital post-processing, you can do the reverse. So a bright yellow doesn't necessarily have to be a light color. It can actually be a dark, dark tone of gray. And that's the beautiful part. It's learning that interpretation and how you envision your image to be. 
So again, looking at those highlights, whites, midtones, and shadows and blacks, and just learning how to play with color to kind of create that, you know, knowing that you want that detail in the highlights and the detail in the shadows, what you might, what might, what would you want white and what would you might like dark black? And of course those midtones in between. So that's kind of a straight transfer of a color wheel into gray tones. And again, we normally think this is a bright, bright color. This would be a dark, dark color. But reality is you can change all that. And that's the beautiful thing. So hue, of course, is the shade of color. Just in case for those who might not know, um, any color has multiple hues of that color. Any shade of, any shade of red is considered a hue. So any color, you can pick a hue of it and you can change that hue. That's a great thing. You can actually change that hue of red. It could be more pinker, more on the magenta side, or it could have more blue in it. So it can be anywhere in that spectrum of red. And of course, luminosity tones, how bright and how dark is that? My, if it creates my pictures in the way, and sorry if it is guys, um, is how bright that color is and how dark that color is, right? So it can be a very light red shade of red or a very dark shade of red. And so it's kind of how you get to play with that. You can make it lighter and darker as well. And anywhere in between. Oops. Sorry, my mouse is not on the right thing. There we go. And saturation. This is what I play with most when I'm manipulating color of a color image into a black and white. It's the intensity of that color. Does it get deeper or does it become more desaturated where it's almost a gray? And how do you adjust that again to change and create the tone of gray that you want to play with? So those three are always the magic of creating cool black and whites. Always playing with those three. So, but burning and dodging then, and that actually makes the burning and dodging. So Ansel Adams was to me, the king of, of really burning and dodging. What he would do in a dark room is what brought his images to life. It took him a while to figure that out. When he made an image, it's like, this is not working for me. I am not getting what I emotionally felt at the scene and burning and dodging did that. So the reasons to burn and dodge, right? To create more dimensionality, to make that two-dimensional image that we have back into a three-dimensional feeling. To draw your viewer in, you can do that by burning and dodging and saying, this is where I want you to look. To isolate an image is the same idea. You can do that with burning and dodging. And for those who don't know that terminology, my apologies of the terminology is burning and dodging. It comes from the days of film. The idea is that you're burning light in to make it a, something darker, or you're dodging the light to prevent light getting on it on a part of the image. So you're making that area lighter. So we still use the term for it. Um, if you want to distract ba basically background images, you can darken areas, of course, um, to turn the lights on in a photo. I call it painting with light. So if I want to, if I got a pathway, I might lighten up the pathway to get you to follow that pathway um, to make things more dramatic and moody, which I'm always in big favor of. And then of course, adding a simple vignette to something. And that's a way of burning and dodging as well. So Ansel Adams, again, was the king of this. There's his straight print. This is, of course, out in Yellowstone. This, I um, mean, not Yellowstone, my apologies, Yosemite, one of his favorite places to photograph. And the straight image is kind of, eh, but look what he did on the right. So I always figured, I always figured if Ansel Adams was around long enough, he would have loved Photoshop. Man would have loved Photoshop. Another one of his famous images, the moonrise. There's the straight print. Blah. <laughs> it's the only way. I'm sure there's a better technical term to say blah, but that's kind of what it is. But look what he did and what he could do to really bring it to life. So I'm. this is a, one of my flowers that I enjoyed photographing. Great color, right? Beautiful pinks and great yellows. But in a straight conversion, if you just do a straight conversion, because it has the same luminosity, even though they are different hues, different colors, they're on the same level of same tone, the same luminosity, that when you make it into a black and white, they just look the same. But here's the fun part about it is you can take it any way direction you want. I went dark one, or you can go light with the other. And that's the beautiful part of it. So I could take that great pink and make it really dark, or I can make it really light. The same thing with the yellow, go dark or go light. 
Now it just becomes which one do you prefer? But that's do a beautiful you, plan. Do you, excuse me, do you do that in, in post-processing in black and white or do you do something in color that you then convert to black and white to get this effect? So I always go black and white first and then I manipulate the color channels. So if I ever go back and look at a color image after I've transferred it to black and white, it's probably not going to look like, oh, not might necessarily look like the same color image anymore. And I guarantee you, and I probably, that's another idea I should do next time in a presentation is show what these look like in color after I transferred them to black and white, because I manipulated the color so much to get this color, like this light white color or the darker that that pink would no longer be that color pink anymore. But I do, I change it. I like to see it in black and white first. And then I start manipulating the color channels, which basically you can do in Lightroom and in Photoshop. It gives you this. So, so you change the colors on the color image and yep. then retransfer it to black and white? No, I'll actually take my color image. I will click, I will go to a black and white layer. So if I'm in Lightroom, I will choose black and white. Or if I'm in Photoshop, I would actually make it a black and white adjustment layer. And then what happens when you get to that black and white, it gives you all the different adjustments, the red, yellow, in Lightroom, they give you orange as well. There's cyan, there's blue, there's green, and there's usually magenta and Lightroom will give you purple. And in there, that's where I adjust. And you'll see it in the black and white, how, the, how those colors are being manipulated. Great, thank you. So I always wanna see it in black and white. And then I go and manipulate the color as I'm looking at it in black and white. So I actually don't see the colors actually see the colors. I see the tones of those colors changing. And that's what kind of gets it. So this is, again, this is a Brinsky point in Death, you know, um, in Death Valley. It's a very popular place to get sunrise. Um, this is like the front mound here. This is the actual point, And then the mountains in the background. Great tones in this thing. Beautiful, beautiful tones. Lots of oranges, some reds and yellows. And then we got the blues and the purples in the background and cyans. But this is a straight black and white when you just do a simple conversion. And that's not going to work in my opinion. You know, there's just too much good stuff in there. But if you do a little bit of a play, the burning and dodging, playing with the tones, playing with the colors, that's what you get. And that could be a lot of fun. Again, something simple as this as well. But look, we have a blue sky with a blue-gray boat. We've got reds, we've got yellows, and so forth. But in a tr simple transfer to, gray, to black and white, everything is just blending in together. Well, the idea is you want to keep that separation so you can see all those different tones. And there you go. So just this simple at work, like just kind of playing with the color, manipulating the color to get the tones that you want. So for converting guys, when I'm in Lightroom, there is a black and white option. There's a color and then the black and white's right next to it. On the left-hand side, that gives you presets, some nice options to kind of choose. And there's about 17 of them. And you can pick with one of them to get you started. I always say, if you're going to choose a preset, know that you can manipulate that preset. You can change anything in the preset. Then there's a black and white panel and it has all the color levels. And while it's in black and white, I start making those adjustments. I start kind of going in there and I kind of start playing and seeing what, how I, by adjusting the reds, the greens, the blues, everything, how that's going to make my, my gray tones change. Does it make them lighter? Does it make them darker and so forth? Lightroom has gone light years in the past year with their masks. Masking is everything to me with burning and dodging because that's where you isolate a part of your image and you basically affect it. You treat the image, you treat that, that, that part of your image. So if it's something like a simple thing, like a tree or something like that, and you want to bring the tones out, you're going to select the tree and you're going to either kind of burn and dodge, make it lighter, make it darker, maybe add more texture to it, make it sharper, however you want to do it. But that's what the masks are all about, especially in Lightroom. I mean, the latest version, if you guys haven't gotten the 2023 version, do so. It's amazing. It also has an amazing people mask um, now. It blows my mind. It actually will select the head, the eyes, the lips, the hair. Crazy, but it'll do that work for you. Um, but when you go in those masks, that lets you focus on a particular part of your image and manipulate it. To whatever you want it to do, whether it's making it lighter, darker, like I said, or changing the color, maybe changing the hue a little bit. 
Um, I use the tonal curve sometimes to add a little bit more contrast at the end. And that's kind of what I do. And there, mind you, there are all these third parties as well. In Photoshop, um, which is, I used to do all my black and white conversions in Photoshop. I've been using Photoshop for 30 years and I still don't know everything there is to know about Photoshop. You can't, I mean, unless you make it your full-time job, that program is, it's one of the most amazing programs out there. One of the most powerful programs out there, but they're always constantly changing it. It's like, I'm trying to keep up. It's crazy. Um, I'm a believer is you learn what you need to do to make your image, what you want. And there you go. But when you're opening it up, if you're not opening it up from Lightroom, but if you're opening up directly through Adobe Raw, which is basically Lightroom in the sense, is don't choose grayscale, don't choose black and white, open it up as a color image into Photoshop. And then you use the adjustment layers because that way it's creating mask layers on top of your base, top of your background layer. And you there's a black and white adjustment. And just like in Lightroom, it has all the color adjustments. But in Lightroom, though, it's even better because you can have hue and saturation, the colors. It's a lot of different things you can do in Lightroom as well. Um, there's curves for contrast. I use levels to help me do burning and dodging. It's masking the same way. I choose different parts of my, in my image that I focus on and say, how do I work it to get what I want? You know, so every part of an image I will actually focus on to get, whether it's the clouds, whether it's a tree, whether it's the water whatever the subject is or part of a building or something, I focus on each part of the element to get what I want out of it, to get the tones and the dimensionality, the texture, get everything I want out of each section. That is the power of masking and of burning and dodging. And it's a beautiful, beautiful function to work with. So, but there are great third-party software guys that has lots of presets. Um, so like, of course, Photoshop and Lightroom, it's a great deal. Uh, there's one called Exposure X7. I haven't really had a chance to play with it. I I haven't. I'm I'm still thinking about purchasing that one. Um, I've had on one for for about ten years. I use it more for my color work now, not so much for my black and white. The program I primarily use doesn't exist anymore. It's a program called Tonality. It was bought by Luminaire, um, but then they got rid of it, and so I still use it. Nobody sponsors it anymore. Um, but I still love it because I had a hundred presets. So as long as it still works, I still use it. Uh, a lot of people love silver effects in, um, Nick. What I don't like about Nick is they have no way of burning and their mask. They don't have masking really. They have ways of doing some burning and dodging, but everything is in circles. It's not as effective. Um, but it has good presets. It does have some good aspects. Uh, if you're a Topaz fan, black and white effects is still out there. If I remember, um, another one is called ADP LumaFlow. So What's beautiful about presets, guys, is the idea is to make life easier. It picks something that makes you're like, oh, I like where this is going. I like the effect, but what else can I do? So no matter what I do in a third-party software, I still bring it into Photoshop or into Lightroom, and I still do more manipulation. I still do most of my burning and dodging in actually back into Photoshop or Lightroom. I usually go to a preset just to get me started, and then I'll go into manipulation from there. But there you go, guys. <laughs> so um you're welcome there's me uh, i'm unfiltered eyes on uh instagram uh my website is there i'm on facebook just either my name daniel austin or daniel austin photography i don't really post on my on my pro page anymore i do mo mo more posting on my personal page um but yes guys and i had told frank earlier and let me get out of here guys i'll stop sharing for a second um that Something I have done for clubs in the past, if, if, if you guys are interested, is I offer like a two hour workshop in editing, in black and white editing. One is for, I do a two hour one for Lightroom users and I do a two hour one for Photoshop users. And it's really kind of showing you how I use, how I make black and whites in Lightroom and, and in Photoshop using all those tools, like either adjustment layers in Photoshop, I how I burn and dodge. And the way I use masks, of course, in Lightroom. And then I sometimes do a really brief demonstration using a third party just to show you, just to expose you a little bit to that. Um, it's on Zoom. It's two hours. We schedule it whenever is convenient for you guys. Sometimes for a lot of people, they like Saturday mornings or maybe a weeknight or something. It's $50 for the two hours. It is recorded. So you have it to have for as a reference. I also create a tip sheet um, that has a lot of the stuff that we discuss as well as a PDF. So 
Um, you guys can discuss that further with Frank if that's it. Um, I sent him the information, but just want to throw that out there. If any of you guys are learning, wanting to learn more about editing or making black and whites, I'm at your service, you might say. So, but if you have any questions, I'm open for, I'm here. <laughs> Danielle, just to clarify, that was $50 per person. Correct. correct. Yes, correct. Thank you. Any questions? Do you well, have I'm, a go-to lens? I'm sorry. Sorry, this is Terry Ann. Do you oh, have hi, Terry. A, yes. Hi. Do you have a go-to lens that you typically use, or I, I mean, I know that you have lots of different scenarios that you brought yes. up, but there must be a go-to lens that you typically use. I have two. My okay. two go-to lenses: my sixteen to thirty-five f four, and my six and my seventy to two hundred f four. They okay. Are my go -to. Um, Thank you. I, do have, I have a macro that when I know if I'm going to be going out shooting flowers, if I'm specifically going somewhere to a gardens, I always take my 100 macro. But a lot of things um, I always have with me, guys, is actually an extension tube. Um, I shoot Canon. Um, I'm shooting with the R5 mirrorless, and but Canon does create their has their own extension tube. It's a 26, a 25 millimeter one, but it works like a macro on a, on a any on any lens. So what's great about it, it's small, it's lightweight. They're not that expensive. I mean, Canon's was a little bit because it's Canon made, but there's so many great makers out there. But if you need a go-to macro and don't want to get a macro lens or don't want to carry another lens, an extension tube is an absolute savior. That oh. is for sure. And then I have my one to 400 if I ever come across wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> But I hate lugging that thing with me. It's a, it's an old one. It still works, but boy, it's still heavy, you know, but I don't, I, I shoot F4, you know, I used to have, when I was in my journalism days, I used to have everything 2.8 because I always needed that extra stop of light, but for nature, I don't really need it. And, it, and it's amazing, you know, cause you guys low, lenses are heavy, you know, they yeah. have, these things aren't getting any lighter. And so with an F4, those lenses got a lot lighter. That's for sure and cheaper. <laughs> uh, you mentioned neutral density filter before. Yes. Are there other filters that you use? No, just my neutral densities are like anytime I keep them with me too. If I'm, if I know I'm going to be like, sometimes whenever I'm focusing on water, I, I, you know, my, my backpack is filled usually with those, with the filters. I sometimes carry gradient neutral density. If I'm doing landscapes, I know I'm going to be in a landscape situation where you're going to have a sky and a foreground. Having a gradient neutral density filter is a lifesaver because sometimes you need to be able to balance the sky up to the, you know, the foreground. But um, yeah, I love my neutral density filters. You know, my, my go-to ones are my six stop and my 10 stop because that allows me to shoot any time of day that I can shoot in the middle of a bright, sunny, at high noon <laughs> and get a long exposure. So those are my go-to. I do have a variable I still use. Um, I used to have a three-stop that ended up in the bottom of a river and out in the Rocky Mountains, and I never ended up replacing it. So, but because I have a variable and that I use that if I need something on a lower end, like a three-stop or something like that, I just keep the variable with me. But love those lenses, love those filters. Lots of good ones out there, especially if you're shooting water. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, great.